Hello everybody and welcome to the fourth Under the Water live webinar. It's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Rachel Bino from the University of Southampton. Rachel is a lecturer in archaeology at Southampton. She's a Paleolithic maritime archaeologist with a focus on submerged Pleistocene landscapes. She completed both her MA uh, and her PhD at the University of Southampton with her doctoral research focused on the submerged Paleolithic of the Northern North Sea through the use of vast historical collections of faunal remains. Thank you to the NAS for inviting me to talk today. Um, and also I should say thank you to Honor Frost Foundation for as the funders. They're also incidentally the people who are funding this year's field season. So double thanks to them. Um, and finally, of course, thank you to everyone for tuning in to listen. I realize you've probably got a lot you could be doing. So I really appreciate you um, coming to listen to this talk. Um, today I'm going to be talking about some of the ongoing work at Haysborough, um, confusingly spelt Happisburg, but pronounced Haysborough. Um, so some of the archaeology onshore and, and particularly the work that we've been doing looking for the submerged landscapes in this area. I realise that I've probably got quite a mixed bag in terms of an audience um, and some of you will be very familiar with the terms I'm using and some less so. So I'm going to start the talk by just running through kind of some of the background to where I'm talking about, when I'm talking about, um, why I'm talking about it before going off into my work. And I've been assured that Mark will shout at me if I go way past my time. So don't worry, you can have your dinner soon. Um, so to begin, if I can get my oh, oh, technical issues. No, it doesn't always do that. There we go. No. Can you see? Mark, is that flashing at you? My screen is flashing. Sorry, um, I'm having No, you're you're not flashing. You're it okay. it just jumps okay. out of um presentation yeah, yeah. mode from slideshow mode into it's your been a year of online and we can't we still can't if, get it right. If you, you could just oh. okay. okay. That's solid now, yeah? Yep. Cool. Okay. Right, let's hope we don't have too much of that. Um so to begin then, where am I talking about? So Haysborough is located, I'm gonna get my pointer out, okay, is located up on the coast of North Norfolk up here. Um, it's right on the coastline and it's a lovely village. If you haven't visited, you should. Um, but it's also a village that is um, being rapidly eroded by the sea. So you can see from these images that go from 1996 to 2012, I should say, um, there's been a huge amount of loss. Okay, so you can see basically kind of this area here from 96 has now gone. Um, and these days, even a big chunk of all of this has gone. And this year we had a huge landslip just inside this bay area. Um, primarily, of course, this has a huge impact on the people that live here, that have their livelihoods here. Um, but it's also impacting on the erosion of a really unique and important archaeological record that I'm going to be kind of talking you through. So when am I talking about then? So when does this relate to? The archaeology and the deposits that I'm going to be talking about today date to the Pleistocene period. This period runs from around 2.6 million years ago all the way through to around 11 or 12,000 years ago and the start of the Holocene, which is the geological period that we're in today. Um, and as you can see, so this um, probably to some people rather confusing looking graph is essentially showing you kind of the changes in climate through time. So ignore the main details and think about instead about kind of the patterning. So we have age along the bottom, we've got 2 million years here and we've got us here, so zero, we are up here. So this is showing you how climate temperature corresponding with sea levels have changed through that period. Um, we're up at the top, so you can see that all of these peaks are warm periods. So this is when the glaciers are restricted to the northern and southern poles. Um, we have quite nice weather and uh, the sea levels are relatively high. The opposite of that, of course, is the cooler periods in the troughs. Now, these cooler periods are when you see the expansion of those glaciers. Um, and you have correspondingly then lower global sea levels. You can see that this has been changing through time and you can see from about 800,000 or so they start to get a lot more intense, right? So we're getting um, longer glacial periods, but also they're much more extreme. Um, and this is really the kind of period of time that when people talk about Pleistocene ice ages, they're really talking about. And the first one that really made an impact in this part of the world, so in Britain, was the Anglian, which is MIS-12, dated to around half a million years ago or so. So bear in mind the Anglian, because I'm going to talk about it in the next slide. 
But this book that Peter's having talking about is pretty much in here, right? So it dates from the Anglian back to approximately a million years ago, which as I'll talk about is when we first start to see humans in these environments. But briefly then when I talk about humans, um, who am I talking about? So we're Homo sapiens and we're not around yet. So during this period of time, we don't actually know the species responsible for the archaeology. Um, it could be someone called Homo antecessor, who we see down in Spain at the same time. Could be a form of Homo erectus. Uh, the younger archaeology could be Homo heidelbergensis. The key thing really is not so much who it is, but the fact that they will have different capabilities, different behaviours to those that we that we know that we have. Okay, and we we understand these abilities less. But moving on and back to the time then. So how does this time period relate to Haysborough? So this is a, a picture of Haysborough, and you can see the cliffs in the background. We're looking to the southeast. Incidentally, these concrete blocks used to be the basis and steps that took you to the top of the cliff. So when I first went to Haysborough, there were steps here and the cliff was about here. Um, so in about 10 years, and probably less time actually, it's moved um, significantly further back. But um, these cliff deposits then, what are they? So these are soft sediments and these were emplaced by that big glaciation, by that Anglian glaciation at around half a million years ago or so. Underlying those cliffs then, we know that the deposits there must be earlier than half a million, so they must predate half a million years ago. So the deposits that you can see in the foreground here that we're really interested relate to something called the chromophorous bed formation. And this is um, a series of deposits that is, um, was laid down by kind of big river systems that were draining the landscapes at this time. Um, they're incredible and they're incredibly unique because they contain um, although they preserve really well lots of organic material that means that we can get a, quite a, a good idea about the environment so that when these are being laid down and the corresponding landscapes. And the chromophorous bed formation runs from around half a million years ago back to approximately two million years ago or so. But as I said, I'm mostly focusing on half a million back to about a million years ago. When the chromophorous bed formation was being laid down, the landscapes looked very different. So at that point, we were permanently connected to the continent of Europe. So you can see the kind of outline in grey. So here's England around here, and we've got Europe over here. We were always connected. So even when things were slightly warmer or slightly colder and sea levels might have changed, the Southern North Sea in blue up here would have fluctuated somewhat, but we were always connected. And what this means is that the, the people, the animals, the plants could all freely move, colonise, do all the things that people do in landscapes um, through this whole area. Um, and we know that they were actually doing that because we have some archaeological sites. So we have the site of Pakefield, which dates about 700,000. But more importantly, for today's purposes, the site of Haysborough up here. And here we have two key sites. So the first is Haysborough Site 1. This dates about half a million years ago. And we find cut marked bone, animal bone. Um, and we find things like hand axes among the stone tools. We've also got Haysborough Site 3. Now, this is really, really important, this site, because it dates to about, uh, well, just before a million years ago, so 0.8, 0.9 million years ago. It's the earliest occupation of Northern Europe, pushed back our understanding of when people were here by hundreds of thousands of years. It's also associated with some of the earliest footprints outside of Africa. And you can see a picture of those down here and these are vines that came from Haysborough 3. So no hand axes at Haysborough 3, just cause and plates. Um, so we often get caught up in, you know, oh, this is really interesting because it's the earliest. We're always looking as archaeologists for the earliest of everything. But the reason these are really important is more to do with the fact that at this early date, what this is telling us about the behaviour of these of these hominins, of these people. Um, so, we know from the evidence that it was incredibly cold, it was harsh, it was, it was, it was interglacial, but it was, it was not warm. Okay, so it was colder than it was today, the winters would have seen significant snow cover. We also know that we, at this point, have no evidence that people were using fire. So how were they surviving in these areas? Were they shooting up quickly from areas like the Iberian Peninsula? Well, actually, that's, that's quite a long way to go, and it's going to get much benefit in terms of precipitation or temperature. We also know from the footprints that we're not dealing solely with mobile groups of hunter-gatherers, we're dealing with family groups. So we've got children, um, we've then got 
presumably pregnant women to think about. If we're dealing with family groups, presumably we've also got people with reduced mobility. So one of the key things about this for me then is how are these people surviving here? And is there anything that we've lost through the submergence of these landscapes? Um, is there evidence in those landscapes that can tell us something about how they were surviving? So did these nearer to the coastal zone productive landscapes, the lower kind of lowlands that we've lost, provide something that facilitated that occupation? So these are some of the kind of bigger questions that we're interested in when we're thinking about these submerged landscapes. Um, and this is a brief kind of uh, reconstruction of what it might have looked like. Oh, I should have also said that rivers at the time were slightly different. So I mentioned that the Thames was pushed into its current position by the Anglian Glaciation. So at about a million years ago, the Thames met up with a, a, the Bison River, which doesn't exist anymore, that used to flow out of North Norfolk. Um, so we can kind of see that in this reconstruction. It's a big, slow moving, low energy river system. Um, and we know the occupation was kind of on the edge of the estuarine zone. So it's relatively close to the sea, but it's not on the coast. Um, and we know from all the finds that we have lots of different animal species, so things like mammoths, things like rhinos, got hyenas, we obviously got humans. Um, this is a favourite of mine. This is Savalsus latifrons, it's brilliant elk. Um, but loads of things that these people could have been using to help them to survive in these quite difficult climates. Okay, so that's the end of the kind of uh, basic background to the why, the what, the when, the who. Um, so we know the time period is kind of half a million years backwards, and we're dealing with the submerged landscapes off Haysborough, where we have these really important sites contained within these deposits. So for the rest of the talk, then, what I want to talk about is um, the research that relates to how we're looking at the underwater landscapes, um, whether they're preserved, and how we can pinpoint them. So I'm going to start by talking a little bit about the historic collections in this area. Um, then the recent collections, so how we're working with collectors these days and the things they're doing. How that is helping us to analyse what they're finding in ways that is helping us to target submerged deposits. And finally, just a little bit about some ongoing work, some thoughts, um, things, things to think about moving forward, really. So first off then, historic collections. So we are not the first people to be thinking about these landscapes or looking at stuff coming up on these beaches. Um, so this on the left here is a publication uh, by a guy called Reverend Layton in 1827. In this, he actually refers to finds that came up of mammoth on this coastline from the 1600s. Um, I also know that you know we've got people like Samuel Peets talking about uh, submerged landscapes at about the same time. Um, but what he's talking about in here more locally is really relevant because he's talking about the fact that offshore you've got trawlers bringing up the bones of these extinct animals. Uh, he's talking about stuff he's finding on the beaches coming up the cliffs or coming from under the cliffs, presumably. Um, he's also making reference to the fact that he's aware that these must be coming from landscapes that have now been lost. So despite the fact that he's talking about it in kind of creation terms, so he's mentioning things like the deluge of Noah, he's still bringing in these ideas that there are submerged landscapes that these are deriving from. We've also got, of course, the, the really famous work by Clement Reed, so this is Submerged Forests, in 1913. Um, and he's publishing images, you know, showing potentially where these, these rivers are going and kind of really looking at some of these deposits. He's also talking about the need to work in a multidisciplinary way, which we know is kind of at the heart of everything we do today. So we've got, all of these kind of documents which are talking about these collections, we actually have a lot of the collections, such as Leighton's collections from museums, that we're able to study. Um, but the really interesting thing that kind of started us off looking for some of these submerged deposits was a piece of work from Leighton, sorry, not from Leighton, from Clement Reed in 1890. And here he's talking about this big storm in 1877. And during this storm, these big blocks of concreted um, Kind of he calls it what's these large slabs of fresh water clay iron stone and pan thrown up onto the beach and these contained impressions of the leaves of oak elm beech birch um casts of shells species of fish basically they were finding fresh water deposits which had been concreted and thrown up onto the beaches so for them for breed this was evidence that underwater these deposits had existed so they went out 
that we've seen here. Um, they went out with a boat to try to find these deposits, and they did find an area of seabed where they were throwing the grappling hook over, and they were bringing up the grappling hook. It wasn't bringing up deposits, but it was scraping on a rocky seabed. Um, and the arming here says the arming showing sand with black specks in this hollow. So, despite the fact that they weren't successful, they clearly found an area of seabed where they had this kind of concreted rocky bottom. In the intervening, it's about like 130 years or so, um, this stuff is continuing to be washed up on beaches. We don't find it forming terrestrially, but it appears to be washing in from these underwater deposits. And occasionally now we also find it encasing bones of extinct species. So this is the pelvis of a rhino that you can see here. So we also have tons of finds that have been picked up along the beaches through that time that we've been able to work on. So some of my colleagues at the Natural History Museum, so Simon Parfit, Adrian Lister, Marcia Breda, have done a ton of amazing work looking at these bones. And they were able to find cut marks on these bones. So we moved from this kind of understanding that there was a submerged deposit probably somewhere out there that was um, at least fossiliferous, to knowing that there was an archaeological site, because we have proxies here for human occupation. I also left this in because although this doesn't have cut marks, I love it. There's no scale, of course, but it's um these are mammoth vertebrae, they're huge. These are a southern mammoth, so they are kind of like the height of a double deck of bus. So imagine the size of their vertebrae. But these two were washed up on separate days, but they refit perfectly. So they come from the same skeleton. And what this is telling us, I think it's two things really, which is that the first is probably not coming from very far because it would be coming across the sediment transport pathway, which I'll talk about in a second. And they're very heavy. So to do that would be quite difficult. So it must be relatively close to shore. Um, but also that things are moving in a relatively predictable way. For these to be eroded out, moved onto the same patch of beach over a, a relatively short period of time. So that's a kind of a, a positive, I suppose, if you want to find things. But anyway, that's a bit of a tangent. Um, these historic finds are fantastic, but they lack accurate spatial location information, right? So you tend to have labels that say things like Haysborough or Eccles, but you don't know exactly where and when they came up. They're also probably biased because they're going to be picking up things that are brilliant, you know, so they'll be picking up the vertebrae, they'll be picking up the pelvis, but those little fragments of stuff probably tend to be um, ignored in favour of the more impressive specimens. This has all changed with working with some of our, some of our recent collectors. So in particular, this is, this is Darren, Joe, and we've got Tim over here, and this is Nick Ashton, who's a curator, one of the curators at the British Museum. Um, so up until this point, everything being found and worked on was bones, and we were looking for things like cut marks. Um, these two walked into a fossil roadshow and had with them uh, a hand axe that they'd found on the beach, right? This hand axe looked identical <laughs> to the one that had been found at site one. So that half a million year site, they had a hand axe that looked just almost like it was a copy of that of that hand axe, it's really impressive. Um, but we started talking to them and it, uh, and it transpires that they've been finding a lot of lithic. Um, so we started working with three of these guys um, from 2014 and, and still to today, although the analysis you'll see here kind of uh, stopped at around 2017. Um, but they were finding a ton of material and uh, in contrast to the historic stuff, they were brilliant and would go out constantly and pick up everything they found, right? So the tiny little flakes, the bits of bone, everything was painstakingly collected um, very kindly because they had to store it in their homes. So it was uh, really, really good of them. Um, they also had GPS, right? So they were getting accurate information about when and where all of these finds were coming up. Um, there's diaries as well that talk about what's going on at the beach. But this allowed us to get this really um, quite significant database together so that we can start looking at the spatio-temporal information that these finds can give us. So although we're working with ex situ finds, so with out of context finds, there's actually quite a lot that these can do in order to kind of to help us think about the patterning and to help us to use that patterning to further understand the onshore record, but also pinpoint areas offshore that we can start looking for the archaeology. Um, so how do we go about doing that? So this is a map 
of Haysborough. So the white is sea and this is land. This Haysborough up here, this is site three, so that's that nearly a million year site. Site one is here in this kind of embayment here. That's the half a million year site. We've also got an interesting area down here, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, a good way to orientate yourself with this, because the maps do jump about a bit, is that it's associated with this kind of, it's called a tombolo. It's where the sand is building up against this shore parallel breakwater. These are sea defences. Um, and you can see that the sea defences are variously good, okay, or no, sorry, good, non-existent, good um, along the coastline. So I'm going to show you a schematic of this now. So again, we've kind of changed direction. So now the site three, the early one is up here, a half million one is here, and we can see the tombolo building up against this shore parallel um, breakwater down here. So up here, we've got some protection from erosion, not loads, as we see the cliffs are still retreating, but not too much movement going on. Around the site one area in area B, because um, we, sorry, these are our sub study areas. So if area A up here, area B in the middle here, and area C relating to Eccles North Cap. Area B is, is, is really open. It's obviously tons and tons and tons of erosion going on. In between B and C, it's pretty good. So we have groins and there's a seawall. So there's not a huge amount of movement going on. But down in area C, because of this breakwater and the wall, we're getting the build up of sand. And what you'll see is, is potentially the, the kind of catching of artifacts of bones in this area. And the transport direction is shore parallel down this way. So moving from area B down towards area C. So how can this help us understand things? So we started, sorry, my emails are going to ping because I obviously forgot to turn those off before I started. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Uh, so we started to think about plotting the points out and then thinking about the density of those points. And we were looking at the density of those points as they relate to abrasion. So here kind of using abrasion as a proxy for movement. So when things are coming up from the sites, we know they're very, very fresh, right? They look like they've just been made. Um, as they move down this way in line with sediment transport, they start to get more and more abraded. So if we look up in area A up here, what we were finding, this is the kind of overall density, we've got site three here, that's the one million year old site. This triangle relates to where we know we've got deposits, but it hasn't been excavated before. Um, and what you find is you get the really beautifully fresh stuff in relatively high densities or very high densities sitting over those known deposits. And then as we're starting to find more abraded stuff, the more abraded stuff is starting to move towards the southeast of those. So it's starting to move in line with where you'd imagine the sands are moving. So what this is indicating to us is that in this area, what we're finding is archaeology that's coming up from known foreshore deposits. It's really interesting because it indicates that site three probably has more going on than it's been excavated. And also that the borehole here, so HC, which is here, um, really deserves some attention and perhaps we could be doing some excavating there. But it's really telling us that most of the stuff we're looking at is coming from those known foreshore deposits, not from anywhere offshore. So what about the other areas? So concentrating on, site, on area B here, which incorporates site one, the half million year site. I'm not going to go through all the densities, but basically we see a similar pattern, which is that we have a high density of fresh material coming up directly over the deposits, right? Not particularly unexpected. There's still archaeology there. It's washing out. It's eroding. It's being picked up. But what we also see is always, with a bit of a gap between them, another patch of higher density material just down to the southeast. So that's approximately here on the map. This does not correspond with any underlying exposures. It's also slightly more abraded than the material we'd see here. And like I said, there's always a bit of a gap between the two patches of high density, no matter how you look at it with the abrasion. So what this started to indicate to us, or the interpretation at least, is that the second group, this group here, is possibly eroding from archaeological deposits in the near shore zone just out here and washing onto the beaches where they're found. That would account for slightly higher levels of abrasion and also the emplacement over an area where we don't have anything on the beach. Um, this is also, I mean, so basically this, this told us that this is probably a good place to start looking for archaeology. Um, it's not entirely surprising, okay, so we know we've got the site one channel, so you might say, yeah, you'd probably go there anyway, but what this is telling us is that there is 
probably archaeology out archaeology out there there's also likely to be preserved deposits in this location so this is our first kind of key area to go and dive to look at stuff the area that i love though <laughs> is this area down by eccles north gap so here so again you have the tombolo here and you can see it here just to orientate yourselves and we have really high densities of material backing up against this first tombolo so of the kind of 8,000 or so lithics that we, sorry, 8,000, 800 or so lithics that we looked at for this, about 70% of those came from down here. So a significant chunk of the lithics were washing up into this area, which incidentally, they've stopped coming up over the past few years. Um, this is interesting because we have no known deposits south of site one. Nothing has ever been seen in this gap. Um, nothing's been recorded by historic collectors and the people that the collectors that we know that walk the beaches constantly have never seen any exposures of anything along here. Um, so there are a few options. One of the most obvious, I suppose, is that things are washing out from here and then moving down the beach and being collected. The problem with that is that the material isn't particularly abraded. Okay, so it's 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 not super fresh, but it's kind of similar to the material that we're finding in this patch here. Okay, so it's slightly abraded. If it had moved all of this distance, we'd expect it to be a lot more battered. Um, the so the, sorry, the what's the word I'm looking for? The sea defences in this area are also much more secure. So it would take an awful long time to get down there. And again, that would lead to it probably being um, more abraded. So this led to the conclusion, or again, the interpretation, that possibly this stuff is eroding out of deposits in the near shore zone in this area and being washed onto the beach as it's getting caught up in the buildup of sediments associated with these breakwaters. And there is some evidence that supports that, or some indications. This is another map that just changes direction, sorry. So again, we have our first tombolo here. So this is basically kind of taking the coastline and making it horizontal. Uh, this is area C, Eccles North Gap. And what you're looking at with the blue and the red is like a minus map. So we have two different bathymetric maps. So this is giving us a topography of the seabed. Um, and you're minusing them from one another. So the red areas show you where you have the build-up of sediment. So you can see here you've got these sand waves, which are characteristic of this, this, this whole area. Um, and the blue shows you where you've had net loss over that period. And interestingly, we have this whole area of loss, which is pretty much exactly where you'd expect um, things might be eroding from if they were being caught up in the system and washed onto the beach. So this um, despite being quite coarse resolution, so I think there's like five years between these two different surveys, so it's not high resolution at all, um, but this gave us a good idea of somewhere we could go and start looking. So we have these two main areas that we wanted to go and look at offshore to try to, to test really our, our ideas. Um, and so that's what we did. We managed to get two weeks of field work funding in 2018 and a week in 2019. Um, last year was obviously a write-off because of COVID, um, 2019 was terrible viz, so pretty much all of the videos and all of the images you'll see are from 2018, where it was kind of like diving in the Mediterranean. It was absolutely wonderful. Um, we took some side scan sonar data. I think you had a talk on this not long ago. Um, I don't actually show you any because I don't have long, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions if any come up. Um, you can see our incredibly professional setup here. It worked really well, actually. We've got some good results. Um, so diving wise then, what did we do? So again, a map to orientate you. Here is your first on Bolo, site one and site three. So we went out and obviously I was really interested in this area. So we dropped in a bunch of times, we did circular searches, we did drift dives, and we found absolutely nothing but those characteristic sand waves um, that we see in the data. Um, this got a bit boring, so Lunchtime on the first day, we thought we'd go up here, we drop in quite far offshore site one, um, but kind of in line with it, and drift down this way to cover more grounds to get a better look. But it was our first week, and uh, obviously the tides inshore were not doing what they were doing out here when my app was telling me what was going on. Um, we dropped in and didn't move anywhere, but dropped onto, very surprisingly, some really beautiful laminated deposits. So this was like striking gold on the first day of field work. Um, I really didn't think we'd find anything other than sand for an entire week. So this was incredible. And you can see this organic sticking out of it here. 
So this is known as OA. This is the wood site, as you'll see, because there's tons of wood. Um, so this is a photogrammetric survey of the site. Right there. Why is this not working? Mm. That's weird. Oh, there we go. Right. Okay, so uh, this line is 17 metres long. Um, and so you can see the kind of natural sections here. So the wood you just saw, or the laminated section, was down here. Um, and all of this is kind of eroding out laminations. It does continue underneath the sand that surrounds this area of high ground here. And you can see some kind of, this is that weird word, worm matting that's forming on top of it. Um, over here, as you'll come around in a second, is a massive piece of wood. So this scale is 50 centimetres long. This piece of wood is incredible. That's over half a million years old. And that is basically a tree trunk. Um, like I said, the preservation of these deposits is absolutely incredible. Um, and this is just a short video to show you the same kind of thing. So again, you've got these natural sections through these laminations. This is a kind of big chunk of compressed PT material. Again, we find it on the beaches. This is that wood, absolutely huge. And here you can see us on top of the laminations. And this is Crystal, one of my colleagues, who is taking a sample, talk over the noise, taking a sample through the laminate deposits. So nothing fancy, but using a plumbing tube here to get some preliminary samples so we can split them, have a look at the structure of the deposits. And as you'll see, also take some samples. It's going to flash again. Wait, wait, wait. Let's see. I don't think it likes me doing anything. OK, so. So we have this wood site then. Um, what else did we find that week? So at the same time, despite the fact that obviously we have these very, um, uh, here we go. Sorry, I don't know why it's doing this. Yeah. PowerPoint doesn't like you tonight. It really doesn't. It's never done this before, I think. I don't know why it's doing it. Um, Mm -hmm. yeah. so I, just, I can just do it from here. Oh, oh, I might be lucky. Okay, okay, right. I'm going to cross my fingers. So, um, yes, yeah, so at the same time, the, so Tim, one of our collectors, he's also the, uh, the lifeboat man in the area. He had been speaking to friends, he'd been finding tons of stuff up near Ostend. So, loads of hand axes, but also mammoth remains. Um, they'd been out in their boat and they'd also found a drop off. So, we thought we'd go and have a look. And we've done a few dives and eventually, yes, we did also locate some more deposits. So these are a bit different. Um, I'll show you, this, this is a horrible video, but you get the idea. It's going to make you feel quite sick, I'm trying to hold about five different things. You can see the broken up deposits on the top here, overlying the cobbles, some really ineffectual hand fanning. And slow motion. I'm going to pause it. Yeah, okay, so you'll start to see through the sand um, these other, this basically different type of laminated deposits coming through. So another area we have preserved Pleistocene deposits coming through on the seabed. Um, this time, very much unorganic. So these are not full of wood. These are pretty sterile, come down on some rather sterile sands. But yet another area where we could do further work, I suppose. By the end of the week, we also had a further area. So we'd gone further inshore from the wood site, so towards where you'd imagine those lithics might be coming from, um, and found another area of deposits, this time turned to moonscape, and you'll see why, because it looks like the surface of the moon. Um, so what these are are basically eroded blocks of glacial till, and it's crazy. Um, right, so here's the glacial till. The interesting thing here is that where my damaged hand is underneath um, is that concreted stuff that's been washed onto the directly under the till we're finding in situ concretions which is basically the stuff that's being broken up and washed on shore containing all of that wonderful stuff um, and this is just a picture of this worm matting again so similar to the stuff i showed you in the video from the wood site um, this likes to form over the hard substrate so wherever we find this in the area underneath it you're either coming down onto that concreted material or to more laminated deposits so this is a really interesting thing that we need to look at in terms of whether we can use this to pinpoint um, areas where we know we've got deposits underlying it and this is the thing that will make my sister feel really sick it's quite um brilliant and kind of gross um so yeah so moonscape then we have this 
in situ uh, concretions, this does make sampling really difficult. So we tried to get some calls. This is a call trying to go through a hole, basically, in the concretion, but everything was really quite mixed up and we didn't get good results. This is the glacial till, which you can also see here. Um, this is also the only area where we've really found any archaeology. So um, some, some really fl fresh flakes coming up, very basic kinds of flakes, but also very similar to the stuff that we find associated with Site 1 and I find associated with stuff washing up onto the beaches. Um, so definitely an area where we need to spend a bit of time uh, and go back to. So by the end of, of those kind of two, three weeks, we've had several attempts at taking samples. So we've upgraded our plumbing tubes to drain pipe. Um, which gives us more sharp. It's like OB, you can see these lovely laminations and this kind of sandy deposit. And at OA, again, some of those really nice laminations. Um, right at the end of the, the last week of this, we also found another area about five metres away from OA. All the time we see really thick laminations, but over here they peter out. And underneath you have a really high, well, really high, you have a higher energy deposit. Um, so it looks like you've got some kind of landscape change going on here. We didn't have time to section it properly. So this is a natural section that they've kind of cleaned up and we have a few samples through these which are being processed at the moment. Um, so we have tons of samples. Hang on, I'll come back to this. Yeah, we have samples through these deposits, um, but what about the archaeology? So I showed you the picture of the flake. Really, we don't have a lot. We're finding um, flakes and bone in that kind of moonscape area, uh, which I think is probably one of the highest potentials for finding archaeology. But of course, it's kind of like finding a needle in a haystack. We're covering a huge amount of ground and often the visibility is pretty bad. Um, not in these videos, of course, but um, for the other dives, it's been last year, the last time we were out, it, it was horrific. Um, however, the last year we were out, this has a lovely story, similar to the two um, mammoth vertebrae that were found. So. Um, two of my divers, two of my colleagues, um, Rebecca Ferreira and Daniel Pasco, found each one side of this bone in the same area of seabed over a few separate days. Um, and this is a mammoth, oh, sorry, yes, a mammoth ulna, I can't get the words out, which is a, a, one of the bones. So for us, it's in our arm. It's the one you'd damage if you defended yourself. Um, but obviously, this is from a, a mammoth, not a human. Um, so what this is, why this is exciting, what it's telling us, I think, is, is similar to the mammoth vertebrae, right? So this is clearly broken a while ago. It's quite abraded, um, but it refits perfectly. Um, and it's covered in bryozoa. So it's been exposed for quite a long time. Presumably it's been moving for a while. And yet the two elements, the two, the two broken halves, stay relatively close together. So we know that things are eroding out and we know they're moving in a predictable fashion. So this, I think, just gives me kind of hope I suppose that if we can, that we that we should ultimately be able to backtrack to some areas of deposit, and this was further offshore too, so this wasn't coming up on the beaches, meaning that potentially we have fossil deposits that are further out, uh, tying it again in with those historic accounts of trawling, the trawling of remains from further out to sea. So there is more out there, um, but primarily what we're focusing on at the moment is those deposits, because if we can understand the nature of the environment, we can start to think about how how the different areas relate to each other, how they relate to the deposits onshore, and how, how we can start to think about where we might find the archaeology and how that will relate to those wider landscapes when we do find it. Um, so we've done some pollen analysis, so there's more underway, but in the small, you can see the plumbing tubes down here, small tubes have been looked at. Um, and it's shown some quite interesting results. So at the top here, we've got wood site, so site OA, where we found all those lovely bits of wood. Um, this is not the same as for Site 1, even though it's basically in a line with the same channel system. Not super surprising because it's, it's about seven or eight metres lower in terms of its elevation and it's in a different stratigraphy. Um, we can see that there's a coniferous element here, but there's also deciduous trees going on as well. We think it's a temperate period. Um, but looks palynologically, so in terms of the pollen, more in line with the earlier site of Haysbury 3, so the site closer to a million years old. Um, on the other hand, site OB, the far site, the one that I said was fairly sterile, um, despite being closer to site 3, actually looks probably quite a lot younger. 
um, and much cooler. So it looks like it's coming out of an interglacial at this site. Um, so we're starting to get an idea of the environments and from the pollen, possibly where they fit chronologically, although only using pollen is quite problematic. Um, through the, the section I showed you where you had the petering out of the laminated sediments on top of those higher energy deposits, we did manage to find a vole tooth. That sounds kind of crazy, but these vole tooth obviously are, are minute. Um, I think they sieve like they sieve tons, 80 tons of material at Hayes for three and found one or something. And I sieved like, 10 litres and managed to find one. So it really was incredibly lucky. Uh, this vole tooth, I think, is shooting around the place with various experts in Europe at the moment uh, because their evolution changes quite quickly. So they can help us to pinpoint chronology. And this vole tooth is from a deposit that underlies those laminated sediments at the wood site at site OA. And we think at the moment this probably dates to around the vault tooth dates around 1.2 million years, 1 million years ago. So pretty early. Um, and we know that the laminated sediments are therefore a bit younger than that. So it is looking like that's more in line with site three deposits. We've also got some evidence from ostracods and particle size analysis. So again, at that wood site, tons of organic, just tons and tons and tons, to the point that it obscured the analysis. I think there's so much in there, it's hard to pick out what you want. Um, but brackish forearms coming through, so it looks like a, similar to the sites on shore, edge of the estuarine zone. Um, also, uh, duckweed fern, so this is indicating that there are, um, there's no long frost, so it's an interglacial period, and it's not hugely saline, so again, kind of edge of the estuarine zone. So that's tying in quite nicely with what we know on shore. For the OB site, the far site up in the north, um, this is beginning to indicate that we're probably dealing here with something that is sublittoral to literal, so probably a shallow marine area, temperate but cool, so tying in again with the pollen. Um, and the particle size analysis agrees with this. So it doesn't look like those deposits are going to be what's yielding the archaeology, but the fact that they're preserving um, and we've got them quite extensively across that landscape means that we can start to kind of look into those further to see how they relate possibly to other deposits in the area that might be yielding all of that material. So I have told you, what time is it? Oh, I'm getting quite late. It's told, I've told you quite a lot about these sites, um, but I started out by saying my most interesting area was down here and we haven't really said anything about it other than we didn't find anything. Um, but it's still one of the places that we're really interested in looking. And I mentioned that we know of no deposits south of here. Um, so it makes understanding this area really difficult. And you can see from this, okay, so again, sorry, another map with a weird view. So we've got the north northwest up here and Eccles North Gap, the area I'm interested in down here and all the archaeological sites up here. But we have tons, so these arrows indicate boreholes, tons of boreholes up here. But down this end, we have hardly any. So it's not really surprising that we're not seeing anything. If this stuff was very deeply under beach sediments, then it's likely that you could walk over it for years and never know it's there. Um, so we want to see where it's coming from offshore. So we did some sub bottom. Uh, so this is basically like taking a kind of section through the seabed to look underneath the sand waves. Um, this is an Inamar seismic uh, parametric system. So it's looking kind of top sediments. Uh, Kind of top top of the seabed, top five meters or so. You can see the sea in May of that year was pretty nasty. Um, these are the lines. So this is our tracking. If you've ever seen kind of commercial lines, they're lovely and straight. This is what happens when you're in a rib in choppy water. Um, and I should also say that I had the help of, of Richard Bates doing this, which was I probably couldn't have done it without him. In fact, I, I definitely couldn't have done it without him. Um, but looking through that data is really quite interesting. So we've got channel systems associated with the far site. So there's definitely more going on up there. So these are quite complex, um, more going on than what we're just seeing in those laminated deposits, which is good given the archaeology on the beach. We've got deposits coming out um, off Haysbury site three, the early site. This channel system also looks like it's in line with what we were thinking would be happening with the site one channels, but We've also got this, right? So we've got more going on. This suspiciously close to where we're finding stuff on the beach. Um, so more complexity coming out here, which actually agrees quite nicely, again, with some of the onshore geophysics that Richard and Martin Bates did several years back now. 
But most excitingly for me is this. Okay, so I apologise. This is really I I uh, I know GIS and some lines is not the best way to show you, but these lines represent where in the seismics you're picking out channels, and I'll show you a few examples in a minute. I probably should have said that stuff. Um, but this this is the area where we had that loss. This is the area where we're thinking things are coming from, and this is the area where we have no current information. So the fact that we're seeing and can you even see my mouse? Let me get a laser pointer out. This, right, this is where I'm looking. So the fact that we're seeing channels coming through in the data in this area is really exciting because it's an area we've never known anything about before. This is some images of some of the channels that we're seeing coming out. And there are tons, there are tons of these images. Um, these are just a few of them. This is actually further north, so you can see this lovely kind of onlapping of sediments here. Um, but this is brilliant because it's showing us about an area that we thought from the finds must exist, but Jack had no evidence for whatsoever. And this is beginning to point us in the direction of where we can start looking underwater, even if that means getting a uh, fibre cause, so getting cause through these sediments. But this is also starting to, uh, to, to make me ask some, some questions about exposure and burial. So on the beach where they're finding the lithics, I mentioned at the start that those have stopped coming up since. So there was a period of time where we found lithic, before that, there was a period of time um, where people were collecting fauna, so animal bones that related to kind of an interglacial stage. The fauna that's associated with the lithics is again a totally different stage, so a cooler kind of cooler faunal assemblage. So we're seeing washing up on that beach different types of fauna, different types of archaeology at different periods. So it's interesting to think about. The fact that we have all of these different areas of potential channels and whether what we're seeing relates to the movement of the sand waves over these deposits. So the intermittent exposure and erosion of different deposits in different areas through this broad area of seabed. And so that's something that I'm really interested in looking into in the future. Um, and it's not something that we, how do I get back to my mouse? I can never remember. Look, look over here. Seriously, I should definitely know how to do this by now. Uh, la, la, no. But, Mark, do you know how I get back to the pointer? You click back on laser pointer because you're already in laser pointer, doesn't it turn it off? Oh, genius. Thank you. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, so this is something that we're also seeing underwater. Okay, so this is an area in the monks that we haven't had time to talk about today. But this was in 2015. And you can see that the whole area is really scoured out. So you can see um, these concreted deposits, again, really sticking out in the seabed. They've been there for a while. Um, this is in contrast to it's exactly the same area a few years later. Okay, where we see this. So just massive sand waves and amazing visibility. Look at that, it's so nice. So really interesting that we can see, we know this thing, you know, we know that sand waves are moving across this area, but thinking about how it relates to the archaeology is something that I'm quite interested in doing because it's something that we also see onshore. You know, you can come down one week and see this, and the same spot a week later looks just like this from different directions. Um, and so thinking about the the process involved in the erosion of this archaeology and its movement onto the beaches, I think is, is going to be key to kind of unpicking the puzzle of where it's all coming from. So to finish up then, because I realise I'm probably going to get interrupted in a minute <laughs> and I'll just stop talking. Um, so we've, I'm not the first person I suppose to say that, that out of context finds have a huge value um, we, you know, we see people working on these in, in lots of different environments, particularly arid environments. Um, they can tell us a lot about the archaeology and here they're really helping us to, to target areas offshore. And although we haven't found the archaeology yet, we're beginning to get a much better understanding of the extent and the massive complexity of these offshore deposits, um, which are, are hugely extensive and I think we're only just beginning to scratch the surface and the more we go and look, the, the more work there is to do. Um, and of course, there's questions here about extensions further offshore, you know, how we really start talking about those those actual 
you know, those actual landscapes are in the middle of the North Sea when we're really just scratching the surface of something that's, that's very close to the shore. Um, obviously happy to talk about that in the questions. Um, but ultimately also I, I wanted to, to highlight the fact that all of this work is, um, is driven by the work of the people collecting the materials. So all of our collectors, you know, we wouldn't be able to do any of this without their hours and hours and hours spent on the beach. And I think that's the same for so many archaeological projects. Um, so big thank you to them. Um, so yeah, that's that's it for me today. Thank you very much for listening. Um, of course, any questions? Um, thank you to all the funders that have funded this work through time, my colleagues, both these places. Oh, and this is the collectors on the beach in the snow. That's how dedicated they are. Thank you. So we have with us uh, Dr. Helen Farr, also from the University of Southampton. We are also joined by Dr. Luke Krutz. I just want to say a personal little one about how I'm so uh, loving the idea of dating by vole's teeth. I think that's... <laughs> oh my God. I know, but it's amazing Like because back when you go back that far, most of our dating techniques, they, they don't work. So we do rely on kind of Venn diagramming all of these different lines of evidence to find out, you know, where we can date something to. And vole teeth, because they evolve really quickly, are, are really useful at that period of time. So yeah, it's... Uh... So I, I, I just, this is a personal interest really, just in terms of voles, in terms of their evolution of voles, and you may not know anything about the evolution of voles, how, <laughs> how much do their teeth change? So, right, my understanding goes like this, uh, it's limited. It's basically, it's, it's the kind of the roots. So you need the, I think it's you need the third molar usually, I might be lying, um, but you, but it's, it's to do with the way that the roots change from an, uh, either a rooted to or unrooted or the other way around and various morphological changes of, of that. I'm definitely not a vole expert, but I have colleagues who are, who I, who, yeah, I'm here. So. <laughs> <laughs> Find out for you, Mark. Uh, it's, it's all right, it's just a little personal thing. I thought I loved that. All different ways we talk about dating and I've never really heard of dating through the evolution of vole's vol teeth. Clock. It's got a name, vole clock. The vole clock, oh man, I've got to Google this later. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> In terms of the, these extreme, sand waves i mean that was that sand wave that you showed in that video right at the very end is massive i mean there's oh, yeah. absolutely monstrous and then the the image you showed from the from land of one one week it's covered with sand and the next week that it's all completely exposed is that mm -hmm. after extreme weather events or is that literally just under benign weather conditions so the stuff on the beaches does tend to respond to high energy events if you have a storm you can scour the beach out but it can change just tidally just um with with less extreme events i think the stuff offshore is less certain i think that uh, so we know that we've got big sand waves that just move along that coastline like you know you, you have these big sand waves all over the place in the north sea um so how they respond to high energy events is unknown because we don't see the immediate result of it. Whereas on the beach, you know, people will say, oh my God, there was a storm and now the beach is scoured out. Oh my God, there was a storm and now the, the sand is two meters higher. We're not underwater enough to be able, I mean, that would be brilliant, I would admit, to be able to, to measure how that changes and how that affects the movement of the fines. Um, but the, I mean, the, the sand waves offshore are, are a permanent feature of kind of movement down the coastline. I suppose that's a, a common, problem of visibility in terms of um, in terrestrial and, and coastal you can see it with underwater things happen and you have no idea yeah yeah exactly uh, yeah. we have we have a question from richard vine has sandscaping further west at backton gas terminal affected your work so someone who clearly knows the area yes this was something that i if yeah if i'd been allowed to talk for hours i would have talked about that um uh, so we'll find out in july um Last time we were there, they were just putting, they were just setting up to put the sand onto the beach. We weren't sure what was going on and the visit was terrible, but I think that's because we just had some bad weather. Um, I would I would hazard a guess that yes. So certainly what's happened at Backton, for those people who don't know about what's happening at Backton, um, is a sand replenishment scheme, put a load of sands from uh, offshore Great Yarmouth onto the beach. And this contains a lot of middle Paleolithic archaeology. So the stuff I'm talking about, hand axes and all the type of hand axes, the Asherian hand axes, cores and plates is lower pal. And the stuff being put on a backton is middle Paleolithic. Um, thankfully, they're 
different enough that you can tell the difference, but it does pose a problem when this stuff starts as it will, moving further south, it's going to start uh, mixing up with the stuff at Haysborough. But we've also got the problem, which is that they put like tons of sand <laughs> just upstream of Haysborough. So I'm like really worried that we're going to get out there in July and it's just going to be like sand everywhere because we know that that sand is being washed out of that beach and you know everyone locally said this isn't going to work the sand's going to move um and of course some of it stayed i think you know it's, i think it's done it's done its job but the sand yeah so is this done over. by this is done by the environment agency um y yes i assume it's all funded by the it's it's a it's aggregates yeah. um but in response to it, it's a sea defense measure basically yeah okay. Uh, okay, I wonder if Helen or Luke have a question or a comment to make or a comparison. I, th I think you're still lucky, Rachel, in, in the sense that um, the finds we are having on the beaches actually actually come from 10 miles out of the coast from a pit 40 meters deep, uh, yeah. which is not very much monitored when it was uh, when it was sucked up and it's rainbowed onto the beach. So actually, I'm quite jealous of the fact that you are able to to connect so many of the of the different archaeology uh, uh qualities to 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 different positions and to different contexts so that's something I, I really think is spectacular and uh i hope that we in the future will be able to monitor better where where all material is, is is coming from to be to able to distinguish between that because we also have different um different time frames we have we have uh, uh salient artifacts and we have auxilian artifacts and and actually we're, we're not really aware of what types of uh, settings they come from. We also find different uh, types of abrasion and, and uh, uh, patinas on them. So there's a lot to gain. And, and I feel that you're closer to, to answering those questions than, uh, than we are. But, but in the end, I, I think it's really cool that the, 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 the outlines of the projects are, are also in a way similar, that, that a lot is due to um, indeed collectors on the beach uh, bringing in information and that's the same same what we're witnessing we, we have a really enthusiastic body of uh, of people uh, walking on these beaches and and in the netherlands that their beaches that they replenish about seven million cubic meters every uh, every year and uh, they find spectacular stuff and and we're really you know getting a grip on that now and, uh, and i really like you know the, the way these projects may 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 even come to more together in the future so uh, yeah so that's that's the thing that so i think that in terms of the soundscaping we're kind of what the same as you right which is that the haze is different of course and yeah i mean all those things are amazing um but the in terms of the soundscaping it's, it is those questions of like, where is it coming from and how do we understand those deposits once it's been taken out on the beach um and that's where i think you guys are like definitely because it's been happening for so long there and you've got such good um I suppose networks of people. So every time I um, well, talk to anyone about it, really, I suppose you know you, you're doing such amazing stuff, and and have been for a long time, it seems, with those with those landscaping schemes, and so much cool stuff is coming up, you know, from the Mesolithic all the way through, right? So um, yeah, I definitely think there's something there for kind of for, for work, I suppose, for crossover and for sharing ideas. Of, of, I don't know. How you deal with that? <laughs> it's just yeah. it's brilliant. Yeah. But it, yeah, you're right. I mean, abrasion pattern and and different typologies and stuff. But yeah, how how you get to the bottom of it is tricky. Yeah. yeah. yeah and absolutely. I think I think it's going to be the offshore record that is really going to be the linkage there between the Dutch record and and what we're seeing at Haysborough. Yeah. So I think it, as soon as you start getting that really deep lower pal stuff coming out um offshore that's going to be the linkage as well that would be amazing yeah <laughs> yeah that would be really cool as well for, for now i think that's that's still the part we're we're missing we're not getting beyond those uh three or four hundred thousand years but of course it, sh it should be there and um yeah it, it's t it's time to get one step ahead of, of also the the yeah you know where the sand is stretched from to be able to to uh, maybe maybe have a have a say in in where it's uh, harvested and and how deep i don't know whether that's possible but that would be really interesting to be able to maybe steer that process yeah steer them in the direction of some of those earlier deposits and get them to yeah. some cool <laughs> yeah that would be a gold mine i'm, I'm yeah. finding it difficult um, to visualize seven cube million cubic meters of, of sand i mean how that, how much area does that cover that sounds massive 
Yeah, well, the, the Netherlands are pretty low country, right? So we, we have to. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's for us really important uh, n not to drown. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it, it, it's rainbowed onto the beach. It's not, not in the same place every year. But uh, we noticed that in, in some areas, for example, the extension of the, of the Rotterdam Harbour and also a place called the Sand Engine, uh, where there's just a, a, a lot of sand and people are finding um, fossils and artifacts about uh, yeah every day. We're with some colleagues, uh, Marcel Nikis is in the audience as well. I think we, we just get finds reported in every day and, and there's some spectacular stuff amongst that. Um, one, of, one of the things I really like, I, I have a replica here with me. So actually this should be black and this is, this is a, a piece of flint with a <laughs> where a birch bark tower was attached to it and it's one of only, yeah one of only three sites in europe where this was found and because we also had a look at the birch bark tower itself we you know it had really told us a lot about the technical uh, abilities of neanderthals but it's, it was found on the beach by by an amateur archaeologist walking it and at, at first we thought oh it's just black pitch should i should i wash it off but we're really glad she didn't but um <laughs> Yeah, it just goes to show that there's so much stuff in there. I sometimes, yeah, it, it, it's sometimes scary in the way that that really you really get the feeling that the, the best sites for the Paleolithic and the Mesolithic are actually in this area, and and we should really try harder to to research it, but also preserve it. Yeah, and that's the, the worrying thing, isn't it? That I always think that we always talk about these things like those people. I don't know, maybe I'm just speaking for myself, but when we talk about Spanish landscapes, we're like, oh yeah. That's where it all is. It's all out there. All the best stuff's there, but we've got no like, evidence of that. But actually, now when we do have these beach replenishment schemes, and we're actually seeing what's being taken off the seabed because it's not being crushed like it would be if it was aggregate, but it's being put on a beach. It's full of archaeology, so it is actually starting to like, in some way, support some of that, or at least allow us to start really thinking along those lines. So. so what always astounds me is the amount of sort of global coastline that's been submerged in that in that period. I mean, I think it's something like 22 million square kilometers of the world's coastlines um, have, have amount of um, land that has been um, that was exposed that's now um, submerged. So if you think about that in terms of what we know about movement, uh, early hominin movement, and and going through into the Holocene as well. That's a huge amount of archaeology that we just don't know because we, we can't get to it. We haven't been looking, and we're seeing sites coming up more and more and more. And so many of those have been accidental. But now, you know, with the work that's happening, more intense work, and especially in the North Sea, you know, there's so much more evidence that's coming up. So I think it's this. It's just there to be found. It's just a case of getting to it isn't it exactly yes i know it's so exciting and then you go out and you see sand <laughs> yeah, so yeah but, fun. but I, I guess a really important thing is you know we like it because we're archaeologists and we're really fond of old stuff but i, I guess a lot of people are, are just not aware at least in the netherlands they go to the beach and they, they roll out their towels but they don't have this idea that they're rolling them out you know in front of this huge very fertile valley which carries a million years of, 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 of human history and I think if you tell people that and then you know that really comes to life and you see you see how, how important that is also to create an awareness and to create also uh, uh, the possibilities to, to, to research it and to get funding and I guess just uh, from our side the fact that we just p picked up on it and started working with it as you do is, has really helped in create a certain awareness and a willingness of people to, to um, yeah, to to embrace this uh, this topic. That's brilliant. Yeah. We have a, a question from uh, Duncan. Are there other similar sites to Haysborough around? Uh, well, he says around the world, but I'm going to go for around the coast, around the UK, uh, particularly on that sort of east side. Um. So probably is the answer I would give. Uh, I, so there's none, none being worked on. Um. The Haysborough. Hayes, Hayes was quite unique in the sense that it's, it's caught up in the Crema Forest bed, which is really well preserved, and it's outcropping along that coastline. So we see it further south at Pakefield, which is kind of nearish to Great Yarmouth. Um, and then again, kind of Haysborough and to the north. As far as I'm aware, nothing is being washed up at Pakefield 
but when we're working with the collector, stuff is being washed washed up to the south of Haysborough, so further south of Nichols North Gap. So I would imagine that yes, they exist. Um, that where you've got these deposits, you'll find stuff associated with them. It's just a matter of it coming up and being found and being exposed and corroded out. Haysborough is the only one that we're kind of actively working on that we know of. Um, but because the chromophores bed is quite kind of unique set of deposits that date to that period and it's quite extensive um i guess that's why we're that's why haysborough is such a good place to look that's why we're seeing so much because normally these deposits don't preserve in the same way and they're, they're much more fragmentary and they're much more dispersed so perhaps you, you don't have the opportunities that we do have haysborough which is why it's kind of a, a bit of a gold mine or a flint mine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> question from kevin um, are, are there any peat oh. deposits in the area associated with the wood yeah, um, so I showed that big picture of the wood underwater, and there was another picture that looked like wood, um, and it's like this, this compressed peat. So we don't find, or I haven't found, seams of peat, but you do find these kind of chunks of peat that's from the same period. Um, and interestingly, um, so you will probably gleaned from my pictures that I'm not a seismic expert. Um, and I did try to get better, but the computer broke and, you know, all these things. Um, but in the seismic pictures, we are seeing in many of the lines, uh, really dark reflectors that look like they relate to peaks. Um, so I've started mapping those out. I just need to get into something else to do a bit better. Um, but yes, is the answer. There are certainly, there are certainly peat deposits out there, which is again, really exciting to see the amount of information that's contained in, in all of that, you know? Um, yeah, yeah. So certainly with high, with um, high resolution seismics, you can begin to potentially recognize layers that, that are organic or have organic material in them. So you can begin to start pulling out these peat layers. So that's a really good way of, of doing it. Yeah. And then it's pouring it to double check. <laughs> yeah. And then I'm like, Dustin. Yeah, I was going to say, you, you, need, you need support from your colleagues in other in departments and other departments with nice access oh. to seismics. <laughs> no, I have, I have, they're, but they're fantastic. But you know, everyone's just, it's been a year of, um, everyone's super busy so it's not really uh, yeah basically need to find some time to go and sit down and collar someone and go and learn it and go through it but yeah there's there's tons in there um and there's more to be collected i think and it's yeah in return for brownies i always find very helpful yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you want colleagues to do anything uh okay we've got a la we've got a couple more minutes folks and then we are going to have to draw it to a close i'm sure rachel's got her glass of wine ready to oh she's actually already got it um were sites like Haysborough and Pake Field perhaps within a big river delta of the Bytham and Thames Paleo River systems yeah um so in terms of delta there were, so offshore earlier particularly we know that the North Sea was like a big kind of deltaic system um at the time of Pakefield and at the time of Haysborough, so when Haysborough was forming about a million years ago, take a million years of the site, um, those two river systems were meeting, it seems, and flowing out there, right? Um, but yeah, it's probably a lot more complex than that. So it's easy to kind of talk about this one river system, but what we see is multiple cuts and channels. And as you'd expect, this, these, are, these aren't just one kind of river system. Um, so yes, all of these deposits are associated with Kind of aspects of those river systems at the time so they're kind of they're, they're the freshwater um deposits that were laid down by those river systems um at Payfield and at Haysborough and at any other sites so all of that chrome forest bed relates to those river systems which is why they're you know probably a focus because we've got freshwater um animals plants open landscapes does the um, do you get access to data, or does your sort of um, discipline get access to the knowledge that's gained from the offshore wind farm developments? The wind farm's been great, actually. Yeah, so Vanguard are uh, putting in a wind. Well, so there's Vanguard Wind Farm, which is Vattenfall, get my words right. Um, who are coming on shore somewhere around Haysborough, um, and they've been fantastic. Yeah, they've um, shared multi beam data um, and. Uh, some of the seismics. So the seismics are interesting because they're they've used a different type. So it's 
it looks further down because they're obviously interested in engineering purposes. Um, so for that, looking at the shallow water is really difficult, um, which is why the, the size that we collected will show you better resolution in the top sediments. But yes, we they they are they are helpful and they have given us access to to data. So yeah, that's so is, is that because they're required to? Do they have to have a contracting sort of archaeologist mm -hmm. consultant with them, or is it because you've got a built managed to build a relationship with individuals? <sighs> They, um, so by law, yes, they have archaeologists, but we're not their archaeologists. Um, so they, yeah, I think it's, I mean, I guess there's a bit of that, but there's also kind of an interest in making sure that they're doing what they can to make, to, to kind of uh, support the archaeology and, and not to not to be part of destruction, but to aid in kind of like learning and understanding and education. So they contacted, yeah, no, they contacted us. Um, as people that are working in the area um, and yeah so we've kind of built up a bit of a, a relationship through that but it was they were, they were proactive in the first place which was really nice so that's good and Helen or Luke had similar experiences with in terms of commercial development and access to data yeah I certainly from my point of view so I work um, in the southern hemisphere I'm working just off northern Australian coast so a long quite a long way away but absolutely, in terms of oil and gas industry, the the data is available and and accessible. So it's been that's been really useful. It completely changes the scale of the work that we can do. And obviously, if we were collecting that kind of data as archaeologists, it would be really expensive. So it makes it feasible. Yeah. And Luke. Yeah, with us, I think uh, the, the augering data is still a bit difficult from the commercial companies, but uh, one very good example was the, the extension of the Rotterdam Harbour, where the, the actually harbour company facilitated an excavation in, in the harbour area of, a, of a, a campsite, a mesolithic campsite on a dune. And, and it, it was a really big project because it's a really big harbour. And um, I, I think of the five or six times they were in the news with the harbour, it was like three or four times with the archaeology. So I also think there's a message for these companies that archaeology is something as as is na as nature and ecology is something very positive they can do. So it's just about finding the means to cooperate because it's yeah. that yeah, there's so so big economical and commercial interests. Uh, uh, archaeology is usually just a, a small bit, but it's a very visible and very attractive. Uh, uh, aspect of, of their projects as well so i think there's a lot of uh, perspective for for future cooperation in that respect mm -hmm. well, well great well on that positive note we kind of run out of time rach thank you so much to you for for your presentation today thank you to uh, luke and to helen for joining us as well so on behalf of the nautical archaeology society our sponsors the honor frost foundation thank you for joining us Enjoy the rest of your evening or your day, wherever you are in the world, and stay safe. Thank you very much.